some thoughts that have been on my on my heart, um, and then and then we'll have um, Abram and, and Stephen share their testimonies. Um, but, but let me open us up with prayer. Father, we we thank you so much that it's 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 only you. It's just your presence, Lord, that we that we want, that we need, that we desire, and so we invite you. Uh, into uh, this time, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to our hearts. Yes, Lord. I just want to be still. Tune our hearts to, to hear what your Spirit is saying. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Lord. Pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so... Um, this is a parable that uh, I haven't often heard shared about, and uh, even as I came to it, it was like it's kind of kind of heavy, but I, I felt like I felt to share it. Um, but but the first the question that I want to ask us today for us to consider is: Are you oily? Very. Like <laughs> share, share is just like ugh. How how oily are you? You know, we, in, in our current context now, when we say you're oily, it's like, oh, you're dirty. Like, oh, like I got to go shower or, you know, I've been out too much or, you know, whatever. But are, how holy oily are you? That's, that's the question I want to ask. And probably a lot of you already are thinking of this parable. Now I'm going to be read, I'll read from Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in the flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So the context um, of, of this parable is Jesus is revealing his return. He's revealing about his kingdom, what, what, that, what that is all about. And he's telling the disciples how to live in that kingdom now. He's saying there will be false teachers. You know, in chapter 24, there's going to be false teachers. There's going to be wars, right? We look around today, we've got wars. There's going to be persecution of Christians. We're seeing that more and more. But he says, don't look at these as time markers. He says, focus. Disciples, my followers, focus on me. Focus on the bridegroom. Um, and so Jesus is making a contrast in chapter 24. He says, there are those, right, remember, who, who beat the other slaves because they're like, oh, the master's not coming. I'm going to beat, beat up the other slaves, right? And they get eat. And they get drunk, um, saying, you know, the master's... He's taking too long. But then Jesus switches gears here in, in chapter 25 um, to those who are actually awaiting his return, at least outwardly. So in Matthew 25, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. But don't, don't get tripped up with the word uh, virgin, right? These were bridesmaids. They're young women who would help repair the bride. Then the bridesmaids would wait for the bridegroom to arrive and then accompany him to meet the bride at the feast. The word here, lamps, it's not like, I think sometimes we imagine like these little lamps with like a little candle. These were actually like torches. It was like a staff of wood with, with fabric on it that was burning brightly. So these are like bonfires on a stick. It was like marshmallow time. Like this was like a fire. This was like, this was party time. But, right, they, they all have these sticks, right? But in verse 2, we see that five of them were foolish, five of them were prudent, right? But notice, it was foolish versus wise, not bad versus good. This is about preparation, about being ready, 
even as we're singing today, Mary and Antha, come, Lord Jesus, come. What's our heart condition? Do I just show up? I mean, what makes these five bridesmaids foolish? They're thinking the groom is just going to show up when it works for me, when it's convenient. I'll, I'll do my bit to look the part. I'll show up to the meetings and, and I'll fit in. You know, it's important to remember that all through Scripture, oil represents the Holy Spirit. It's worth taking a look at just this one passage in Zechariah, just to really soak in this reality that there is a holy oil and that God wants us to be an oily people. So in Zechariah chapter 4, Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. He said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand all of gold with his bowl on top of it. Imagine something like a torch and it's seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking to me saying, what, what are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, and you guys are familiar with this, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So there's a pouring out of oil in our lives that prepares us. But we see there's this theme of sleep again, right? Back with the bridesmaids, there was the delay, and they all fell asleep. And both, remember, both of these became drowsy. Both of them fell asleep. Now here in my heart, there's difficult times for all of us, the Lord doesn't promise us easy times. He doesn't say it's going to be an easy ride. But He does promise that He'll be with us. Always. And it's in those difficult times, it's in the darkness, right? That we get lulled to sleep by the cares of the world and the difficulties of life. But then in verse 6 we see at midnight, there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. So at midnight, that's the, it's significant that Jesus picks midnight, because midnight is what? It's the beginning of a new day. There's a new day for us. It's still dark, but there's a new day coming. There's light breaking in soon. There's hope. But hope isn't wishy-washy. We have to have hope, because hope is a confidence. Hope is a strength in the Lord that is, a, is an anchor for our souls. So whatever you're going through, no matter how dark the hour, a new day is coming. And they all awoke, they all heard, and they were all getting ready, right? But remember, what, what did the foolish say? The foolish were like, oh no, I'm out of oil now. What, 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 what should I do? And the prudent ones say, well, we have brought ours I can't, we can't share it with you. So the oil is personal. There's a cost. Oil has to be crushed. It takes time. There needs to be fruit that's ripe on the vine. Your parents can't give you oil. Neither can your Christian friends. You know the saying that, you know, you're the summation of the five closest of your friends? Well, that means nothing if they're filled and you're not. You need contact with the throne. You need the Lord to pour out that oil in your lives. But the, the bridesmaids, they're deceived into thinking that contact with just others on a horizontal plane somehow brings contact in the vertical plane. It's easy to read a parable like this and either just skip over it and maybe feel a little scared and uncomfortable, but Jesus really wants us to come to attention when we read this parable, when, when we think of what he's saying. You know, attention is a kind of currency. That's why you pay attention, right? It makes a difference what you invest your attention in because what you, you reap, what you sow. There's no greater upside in eternity than to pay the price of attention and spend that on the Lord. The reward when you pay attention is connection and His affection. So what are the foolish left with? They're left with a door that's closed. 
we have to see that our priority has to be His presence, nothing else. That's where everything else flows from, His throne, His heart. You know, think of Mar Martha. She's got so much going on. She's very stressed. She's doing all the right things. I can relate. Do the right things that look good. We're so busy, so distracted. But Mary is the one who's collecting oil at His feet in the quietness. Literally, even as Leah was sharing, be still. Stop your body. Stop the hamster wheel mind. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. And the result is getting under the flow of his anointing oil. It's not just showing up to meetings, you know. It's meeting with him in between, in the in-between spaces. It's who you are. You need, we need to trim our hearts, right? You know, sometimes candle wicks. Anyone who's burned a candle? Has anyone burned a candle here? Yes? You know, when you burn a candle, after a while, what do you have to do? Cut the wick. Cut the wick. You've got to trim the wick. Why? Because when the wick gets dirty, it becomes smoky and sooty. In the same way, the, the, the wick we need to trim, but we can't just clean ourselves up, right? The, the greasy kind of gospel says that Jesus will just open the door for latecomers. He'll be understanding. He'll have mercy, right? But then we read on here. J Jesus says, truly, I say to you, I don't know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. That's, that's shocking to me. That's sobering to me. That's, it's sobering, right? Because these five were waiting. They thought they knew Jesus, but Jesus said, I don't know you. So hear me now. Again, you know, the greasy gospel these days, they say, just believe in God and you'll be okay. But it, it's not so much whether you know who He is. The demons know and believe who He is. The question we really need to ask ourselves is how much does God know us? Remember, it's not what you've done or how much you've done. It's how much you've spent with Him, how much time you've been with Him, how much you know His voice. It's all about intimacy. I'm reminded of that demon-possessed man, right? He, he, he did all the right things. He saw Jesus, he bowed down, he worshipped, said he's the, the Christ, calls for mercy. But Jesus didn't know this man. Not yet. It was a personal encounter with Jesus, with Jesus' power. When we encountered Jesus, he cast out those demons, and Jesus knew him because now the Holy Spirit had a space to dwell within the man so he could know the man, he could see who he is. So, practically, how do we check this oil out? How do we, you know, we got a, I have a car, you know, and it's, it's old. It's over 20 years old. So, first of all, oil lubricates. Um, we have a mechanic that's my uh, Grace's dad's old friend and Grace's dad's a little worried, you know, as we drive around with this 20 year old car he, and he's like, can you check the car? Can you please check the car? And so he's checked the car and he said, the only thing he needs to do is to make sure that there's motor oil in the engine. Just check the oil. And it's, it's in the same way, right? Because we, we all know, the oil keeps the engine running smoothly. But over time, the oil can get dirty from wear and tear. You need fresh oil. You can't let it go stale. Oil enables us to kind of WD-40 that door of our hearts to just open up and go right into His presence. Do we recognize His voice? Can, can we just ask? How do you hear His voice? Just consider that. How do you hear His voice? Are you a seer, a dreamer? Are you a knower? It's the oil that lubricates that the Holy Spirit that, that enlivens our senses so that we could be fully alive to Him, not just mentally and intellectually in His Word, but engaging with the Holy Spirit with living power. So second, the oil heals us also, right? The Samaritan poured oil on the neighbor's wounds. When we're hurting, we need that oil from Jesus to heal us inside and out, to cast out demons and raise the dead. You know, it's like um, 
When you squeeze an orange, what do you expect to get? Orange. Yeah, orange juice, not a trick question. When you squeeze a grapefruit, what do you expect to get? Grapefruit juice. Grapefruit juice. Now when you squeeze a Christian, what do you expect to get? <laughs> Christian juice. Christian juice. Christian juice. <laughs> anointing oil and but I don't know let's be honest sometimes you squeeze a Christian what do you get lemon, lemon. <laughs> maybe even worse that that's a tangy Christian but but so we see you know sometimes the oil when we are open to the oil the Holy Spirit will pour that out upon us I'm reminded of that that widow of, with Elijah he was like bring the vessels and she brought vessels and kept filling, kept filling. As, as, we, as much as we're willing to open space in our lives, the Holy Spirit will fill that space. As much as we give Him, He will fill. And so oil heals, oil lubricates, but oil also attracts, right? Attracts. Um, when we give testimony, Sometimes the most powerful things that we can share, often the most powerful things that we can share is the, our testimonies of that, that, that touch of the Holy Spirit, of the power of Christ to transform our lives, to bring us back to life, right? And so it, there's that light and that fragrance. You think of Mary breaking that vessel, the aroma filling the whole house. You know, this, this anointing oil is not just Personally, we have that personally as well. But as we come together, there's a, a fragrance of Christ that gets poured out as we worship together and we pour out that oil that was poured out into us. Um, and so we need those torches, right? We need those torches, but we need to be the vessels also to have that extra oil in, those, in the hiddenness, right? The oil is kept inside. There's a hiddenness in, in this, um, this opening of our vessels to welcome the pouring of the oil you know in second timothy it says that for this reason i remind you to kindle afresh the gift of god which is in you through the laying of my hands for god has not given us a spirit of timidity but of power and love and discipline so this is the spirit of jesus is power and love and discipline and so one way that we can kindle afresh this flame to invite air, to stoke that, that torch in our lives, is to speak out our testimony, to remember the gifts that we've been given. Um, and so I just want to invite our brothers to share. They're from Seattle. I love them dearly. We've been fellowshipping over the last few months. And uh, I just want to introduce Abram. He was uh, he's a Marine. Um, and, uh, and our brother was baptized yesterday. Yeah, hallelujah. So um, let's let's praise the Lord. This is uh... all right. Hello, is that loud enough? Should I put it closer? How are we sounding? Good. Okay. All right. Well, I'm Abram. I'm here from uh, the Seattle area. We said north of Seattle, not Seattle. We don't claim that city. Um, no, I. You know, I. Uh, I, I have only been, I've been a lifelong Christian, um, but I fell into a lot of darkness, and, and it's, my story is not typical. It is a dark, very dark story over the last couple of years, and, uh, but it has a great ending. I'm standing here, and I have more than just a smile. I have joy, and a path, and a life, and missions, and things that God is using me for to reach people. And I'm not a public speaker. I'm a retired Marine Master Sergeant. And I've traveled the world, did a, did a lot of things. Um, but uh, there's something, I told this story, uh, some, some, a part of this story to a board, a, a Christian company here in New York a few days ago. And I was just full of vigor and passion and just got everyone amped up and it was great and fun. And, but today, for some reason, I'm, I'm learning to hear the Holy Spirit. I'm learning, I, I, you know, I, I don't, completely understand. I hear him, but I'm, I'm trying to really follow his lead. And something in me today has me a little more cautious. Just something, just something's telling me, not, not a dire warning, but just, just a little bit of a wake up, Christians, kind of a 
tone. So let, let me delve into this. Um, so great career. I had an amazing career. I had a beautiful wife. Uh, we, we, you know, we didn't have any kids. I have a 25 year old son, but that's a but, uh, different uh, relationship. And um, so going through my career, I was, uh, you, you know, believe it or not, 40 pounds heavier than I was now. I was massive, big, big tank. Um, and so I was a beautiful wife on top of the world, house on a beach in Tybee Island, Georgia, uh, top of the world. And um, then everything came crashing down. I was retiring, losing my sense of purpose. Wife was starting to pull away. Uh, my physical, I was getting smaller. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't function. My brain for about 10 years after one combat deployment in 2010 to Afghanistan. Uh, I've done six Afghanistan, Iraqs, uh, and. Um, after that deployment, my brain started to get, to, to kind of sh go into itself and I couldn't figure, I'd get confused and I couldn't understand what was happening to my brain. You know, I'd drink to cover some of it up, but, but uh, I just couldn't understand it. And I got sick, I, you know, from intestinal to, to brain and back and my body was falling apart. By the time I got out of the Marine Corps, I mean, I had, my beard was breaking off, my, uh, I mean, I just had, my body was falling apart. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't understand what was happening. And uh, so the wife ended up leaving. Um, and I went into a period of uh, insanity. It was insanity. And, uh, you know, you think, you hear about veterans that just go nuts. I mean, a lot of my friends have, a lot of people that you hear. You see the movies, you know, Tom Cruise, you know, that kind of thing, Fourth of July. Um, but, but, you know, you see these guys go crazy. And I just thought, you know, Am I going to be that crazy veteran down the street? I, I almost resigned myself to it. Um, you know, after a while, I, I couldn't stay in Georgia anymore. And uh, uh, I moved back to Seattle about 11 months ago and um, started to get into a lot of drugs, uh, a lot of drugs. But my brain, and the drugs didn't help my brain, that's for sure. But uh, I was so far gone. I couldn't, I couldn't have had this conversation. I could talk to one person in front of me. If I lost, if they interrupted me, I would lose the thought and I'd be gone. And then I, I wouldn't remember names, nothing. It was a con total confusion. Could, no, no explanation for it. One day I'd be up, the next day down. One day happy, sad. It wasn't, there was no uh, hungry, not hungry, sleeping, not sleeping. Day was night, night was day. It was confusion. And, you know, I went to the VA. I got on bipolar meds. I thought, I thought you know, I, I really felt that things were talking to me. I didn't hear an audible voice. I just, I thought, felt that there was a push on my brain to, to say certain things. I felt passionate about things. I heard things in my head too. Uh, one of them, I'll just share a couple with you. Besides the dark things I heard, I heard my name. It was Abram Elias, because I went by Abe and Buzz. That was my nickname. And uh, it was Abram, Abram is your name. And the second was purity and truth. And I heard those through the insanity over and over and over. And I cannot explain to you what it feels like to go insane. I ran hundreds of people. I literally ran whole units for commanders. It was my job. I knew everything about everyone. That's what I did. And I came back to Seattle insane, literally insane. There was a point where uh, uh, you know, I almost chased two guys off the road. I, you know, they were young, a little younger than me. I don't know how it would have ended, but my brain didn't care. And I just had to get a hold of them. And after that day, this is January of this year, so let me tell you how recently this is, um, I hid. I went to my house in Seattle and I hid because I couldn't, you know, I'm not gonna go to jail. I'm, at least I'll just, like I said, resign to be that crazy veteran down the street and just be the guy that's a little bit wacky and know when I can go out and when I can't. Um, so none of the pills work, none of the drugs work. I started in, uh, so it was this March of this year. Uh, I had one low point, and this is where the warning comes in, and this is where I started to see what was really wrong. Um, I was sitting on my couch uh, in Seattle, and I was looking at my TV screen, and I was on the couch, kind of laying down, and I couldn't move my body and I couldn't move my head, I could only move my eyes. And I just staring at the TV screen, tears pouring out of my eyes, couldn't move, and I just cried to God for mercy, just mercy. Something helped me, I didn't know what to think. Now a normal mind would have thought, okay, there's something seriously wrong here, dude. You're being, you cannot move, 
this is there, there's something wrong, but my brain was that far gone. I can't stress that enough. Uh, I just didn't know what to do. So what, smoke another joint? Do another line? What, what, what was I going to do? Um, and so after that, I, my brain started to clear up. After I started, to ask, I asked for mercy. My brain started to do a little bit of clearing up. And then um, I told God. I knew that there was darkness, there was good. I was a Christian my whole life and Christian. Um, but uh, uh, I told God, let me just swing a hammer. Put me on your mission field. Let me swing a hammer. That's it. I, don't, I can't think. I can't speak to people. I can't hold a conversation. Let me just swing a hammer, God. And then a couple weeks later, April 3rd, my aunt calls me, his wife, um, called me and said, hey, you want to come to church? And so I went to church. Uh, taught, and she had me talk to the missions pastor at our church. And something sparked in my head, and I started to think a little clearer. And I went to church for about three weeks, and then my aunt calls me and says, hey, you want to go to New York and meet your uncle? He's on a mission, speaking to people on Wall Street. And I was like, something in me said, go, go. And I just, within 24 hours, I was in New York. Showed up to his room in a tiny, tiny little room, just broken, just completely broken. No drugs on me, no alcohol. I just knew something had to change. What was I going to go back to, y'all? What was I going to go back to? I've done it. I've done all the drugs. I've done everything. I've done from sex. To, there's nothing in this world that made me happy. I was free. I had a retirement check. I had a motorcycle, a car, apartment in Seattle, single dude. I don't look too bad. <laughs> I mean, I should have been doing all right. I, I had nothing to go back to, absolutely nothing. And I, God knew it. He let me get to the lowest possible point, suicidal and ready to just be done. And he said, all right, go to New York. And I met him, and he spoke words of life into me every single day. And I asked crazy questions, just trying to grasp. But it was like as he spoke words to me, they sunk in. And I just started to realize, and then the fragments of my brain started to come together. It's, it's hard to really understand, but it's, it's, it, it, he was feeding me. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, was feeding me. And he knew what was wrong with me. Um, I had an enemy, and the enemy was holding me down. And I didn't know that till a week later. And I went to a spiritual warfare conference in D.C. I don't know if you know Ken Fish and Matthew Sue uh, in the New York area, Matthew Sue my good brother here. Um, and so I went down there and it took a few days, uh, me confessing and little things and trying to figure it out. But I started to see as they talked and other people were delivered, I started to see the demonic and spiritual world and things that people were saying were things that I thought I was take, had been taking pills for and drugs for. And I started to see a brother Jack, you know, I talked to brother Jack, Chan, you know, and he told me things and he was just, things were coming together. Um, and then uh, on the way back from the Spiritual Warfare Conference, I got in a car with Matthew Sue and uh, Steve and, and a brother, Woj Wolf, and uh, let's just say it got hot and heavy. I had a, a, a list of things, and I'll, I'll, I'll cut that off, but um, let's just say it was a, a physical deliverance where something came out of me in that car or the hooks came out of me. I don't know exactly what to say. But right in that moment, in that car, my brain, pop, just came back together. And I saw clearly how I'd been lied to. I saw clearly the lies I believed about myself, the things that I just, complete lies. And it came together, and right there in that car, I swore my allegiance to the Most High, just right there. And I got mad at the enemy, because I knew right there what had happened. God showed me, and then it's been for the last two and a half, three months, it's been me recovering. He's feeding me every day. The Holy Spirit is teaching me every single day. And uh, there's so much more to that story. And it gets so dark when you're in those dark places. I know we all know dark places. But um, I, I think what I really need to tell you um, is to, to, to Christians, uh, we have an enemy, and that's easy to say, easy to hear at church. Uh, I've been held down by that enemy. I have been tormented, tormented by that enemy. They wanted me dead, and they want all of you dead. They really do. 
And um, especially when you're effective, if you're effective for the kingdom, they're really going to want you. Um, but just a, a, a warning to realize that, that he's out there. And what my story for me, what, so what's, what's my reaction? Well, my reaction is I want to fight that enemy. I'm a Marine. I want to fight that enemy. So I'm going to learn. I'm going to go to school and figure out how to do that with, with some brothers here in New York. But I think the one question I got two days ago, and it changed my story, and as I, think, I think, believe it's brought me to this point. I got home from New York last time, and I, just, I came back you know, this last month, and my uncle and I and my aunt, we went through my house, and we grabbed a tra I grabbed a trash bag, but the Coke, the acid, you know, I'm talking misogynistic books, uh, everything, condoms, every anything in my house and life, anything, deleted everything off my phone, done. So the question for y'all is, or for me, was what was it that got the enemy's hooks in me? When, and when was it? I don't know. Was it at war? Was it something I did in war? Possibly. Uh, uh, was, it, was it some drugs I took? Was it some woman I was with? I, I don't know. So what's, what would be my response? Well, my response was get rid of everything. D done. Nothing. I mean, there's nothing left in my house. My house is a sanctuary. I, if I could, the torment, you think I'd put myself in that place again, in that kind of torment? I mean, so you may never, God, Jesus willing, none of you ever get to that point, ever, because it's hell. It's hell. But whatever level you're at, what is it in your life that could get those hooks in you, those demons, and they love to torment. They love it. Um, and just if, if look in your life, see if there's anything that might let the enemy in. And it might be a lot smaller of a thing than you think. Because I don't know what it was for me, but I'm not taking a chance. So now, bright side, I'm going to be on the mission field. I'm going to start spiritual warfare and really work with people, knowledgeable people that, that know how this works because I don't really know. I just know I have an enemy and I want to fight him. I don't want to be too cocky like a Marine. I want to take it easy because the enemy has been doing this for thousands of years, right? You know, he, can, he knows the right woman to send after me. He knows the right thing to send after me to make me go, oh, all right, check myself. But, you know, I just, but now I have a passion. I have a burning passion. The Holy Spirit ignited in me. I don't just go to church. I don't just try to live right. I, I, I believe what happened was, I gave up everything. I dropped my fishing net and my fishing pole and said, all right, I'm just walking this way. I have nothing. I don't think, well, I got to drink this weekend or I got to do something. It's just, it's gone. And I have a freedom in it. And I'm totally, man, I get, to, I get to serve people. I'm retired military. I get to go around the world and serve people. Earthquake in Nepal. I'm there. Uh, wherever it might be, wherever God sends me, I don't get to just choose. But wherever God sends me, I'm going to go. And that is the coolest thing ever, you know? So that's my testimony, and I love you all. And, and this is my Uncle Steve. Okay, am I on? Yes. Got it? Okay. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I want to read a scripture and then give a, just a short little story about, of my life. Um, we've already talked about uh, oil and lamps and uh, spiritual warfare. And I want to read a promise that Jesus gave his disciples before he left this planet. He said, you guys really like me. You want to be around me. And I've been telling you, I'm going to leave. But he said, it's to your advantage that I leave. Because when I leave, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to send you another helper 
like me. And he's, already, he's in me, and so you like him. But he'll be in you. And you'll be better off without me. That's pretty crazy. How could you be better off without Jesus? Don't you think if he was here, I mean, we could just, it'd be so amazing if we had Jesus here. Well, we do. But it's by his spirit, and now he lives within us. And so we heard what Jesus said to his uh, disciples. This is in uh, John 14. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, another helper, who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you. In other words, you've been seeing him in me and later will be in you. So this is a, this is a promise that is, is really exciting for all of us. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I'll come to you and soon the world will no longer see me but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. So Jesus really set the disciples up to be prepared, and we know in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit came, and the church was born, and life changed. A whole bunch of Jesuses were running around, Jesus in people, by the Spirit. And so I'm... uh, I've been a pastor for a number of years. I've had actually four pro- professions. I was in the uh, entertainment industry, which is football. Anybody ever watch football? We have any New York Jets fans here? We got to. And if you're not a Jet fan, I'm looking for them. Because <laughs> I, I played for the Jets uh, back in the, uh, 1968, and the year they went to the Super Bowl, I was a rookie. And so this is a Super Bowl ring. In case you haven't seen a Super Bowl ring, it's older than most of you here. It's, it is. It's over 50 years old. It was 1969, January, when we won. Joe Namath was our quarterback. And I played on the, uh, the defensive line. I like to hit people, so if, I, if you get too close to me and make a quick move, I may just, you know, I, I could do a headbutt or something like that. I love violence. You guys are called to a violent a violent game, or it's not a game, it's a violent life. You have an enemy that follows you around and he is looking after, trying to figure out ways to, to get you to fall and to fail. Isn't it tragic when you see a pastor, a leader, uh, somebody who's influenced the body of Christ in their old age do really stupid things? We read about it all the time. Another pastor fell, another leader fell because they haven't guarded their heart. Like, like Abram is talking about, we have an enemy. And so when I came back to New York, I really didn't know whole much, much about that whole demonic realm. I was, I was raised in the church and had a relationship with, with Christ as Savior, but never learned how to follow him, never learned about the Holy Spirit that he taught his disciples about. So when I got back here, I came back with, with my Christian life kind of uh, in my back pocket, and then I was living for myself. And uh, after we won the Super Bowl, of course, I was uh, pretty thrilled about that whole experience. And I played six more years with the Jets. But in the middle of all that, I had an addiction that I brought with me from, from high school and college, a sexual addiction. And I was, I was a Christian on the weekends, and I could even get up in front of the church. But then there was this thing inside of me that just used to like a, like a, a ring in the nose, just would pull me in different directions. And I had this double life going. I got married, had a beautiful wife, still married to her 56 years later, I think, something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm 76. Yeah, that's a great idea. Hey, by the way, today is my anniversary. Yes, 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 yes. It's 50. 57, you told me. Is it 57? That's a lot of years. Yeah. And I did already call her and said, happy ber- uh, Mary- what is it? <laughs> happy anniversary, daughter, uh, wife. I have one daughter and six boys, so I have seven children, nice. 28 grandchildren. Nice. If you're a pastor and you have trouble getting people, get married, have kids. <laughs> and have more kids, and then have the kids have kids. And I got 28 grandchildren, and so I'm, I'm busy just in that life. But in coming back to New York, you know, I experienced the highs and the lows. 
to me, you got the best of the worlds and the worst of the things that, you know, New York has the worst and the best. I love New York. My wife does. And 20-some years ago, the Lord put on my heart, I'm going to call you to Wall Street. And you're going to come and you're going to help people that work on Wall Street learn how to follow the Holy Spirit, follow Jesus at work. And so I, I got my master's degree and my doctorate degree in the last five years. And so I'm now Dr. Stephen Thompson at 75. And so if you're in your 70s and haven't gone back to school, it's time. <laughs> Serious, I, I did. I did in my 70s. And, uh, and I asked the Lord, why now? He said, because now you'll listen to your professors. He said, before, you know, you, you went to school to play football, and he was right. I just had to keep a, you know, a C average, and I could play football, and that's all I did. didn't really listen or learn a lot. So you can, you can still move on even in your 70s. But a few years ago, the Lord said, I'm calling you back to New York, back to Wall Street. And last October, he said, I'm giving you a green light to go. And what I want you to do is I want you to meet with people that work in the market, and I want you to pray with them. I want you to teach them how to hear my voice. In, in uh, John 15, it says, my, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. Well, if you're a sheep, you've got ears to hear, and, but we need to learn how to train ourselves to hear what God is saying. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm meeting with people one-on-one -on -one mainly and sometimes in, in pairs, but teaching them really that they're called if you're working on Wall Street, you need to know you're called. If you're working anywhere, and all of you have jobs, you want to know you're called to it. The Lord calls people, not just to pastoring. I've been a pastor for 30 years, but he called me to business. He called me to, when I, when I, when I was called to sports, it was really the entertainment business. Without the entertainment factor of football, there wouldn't be all the money involved with it. So I was in the entertainment world. I was in the ministry for years. I was 10 years as a, as a business uh, uh, counselor, and then now I'm back here in New York. And so I love your city. I love being back here. Um, nobody understands this ring anywhere except in New York. You know, most people see me wearing that ring that says, uh, did you get that from your son or your grandson? What's an old guy like you wearing a Super Bowl ring? And I said, well, it's been that long since the Jets have been to the Super Bowl. So, you know, come and help us, you know, cheer us on. Uh, so I, I'm, I just want to just, just share just briefly about, you know, I was here, I had the highs of, of a Super Bowl, I had the lows of having a sexual addiction, and in the middle of all that, the Lord spoke to me when I was walking on the street in New York City, pursuing my addiction, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, uh, Stephen, you're going to hell, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm Baptist. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you've been raised in the Baptist church, I mean, you know, you, you really figure out salvation, right? And you make sure you're, you got your, your ticket to heaven. And the Lord just cut through my Baptist theology, and he said, you're following the one who's going to hell. It's really a lot more, not just what you believe, but what do you do, right? You can believe all the right doctrine and not follow Christ, not be a follower. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you. Well, you've got to do something to be a follower. You've got to listen. You've got to read. You've got to pay attention. You know, there's, there's aspects to following that, that become part of your, your lifestyle. And so when I'm working with people on Wall Street, that's a big question. What do you do to, as you follow Christ? What is, your, what is your plan? If I was watching you from a distance, how, what would I see you doing as you're checking in with the Lord? And as, and as I share with them, it's really headquarters. You know, we have a headquarters in heaven. And that's where Jesus and the Father are, right? Hold it. Is that right or not? Did I miss that? We have headquarters in heaven. And well, someday we're going to go there. And Jesus said, I'm going to talk to the Father, and he's going to put a place for you together in the Father's house. But I'm going to ask the Father, he's going to send the Spirit. We've got a Spirit down here, right? That's our connection with headquarters. You tracking with me? Well, if you want to find out what headquarters wants you to do, you need to connect with the Spirit, talk to Him, talk to the Father, talk to the Son. So you have this conversation going between the Trinity and you, and, and the Holy Spirit helps you. And so I'm back here specifically because I've been, been trained by, by the Lord to hear His voice and to talk with people who are called specifically to Wall Street. And so I've been doing that now. I've had three different visits, and I'll be coming back and 
and living here probably half time and uh, meeting with people and just talking like this kind of conversation, mainly with believers. I want to wake up believers that you are dangerous when you get, when you get your, your uh, assignment from headquarters. When you start hearing what the Father is saying, what the Son is saying, remember Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. If you hear me, you hear the Father. I only do what the Father says. You like Jesus? Then you're going to love the Father because that's all he ever talked about. You've got to think about this. I mean, Jesus saved us, but his point was to get us back to the Father. And he knew the Holy Spirit was what we need. So I'm kind of stirring you with, with, a, with Trinity talk. And, you know, it's important that we recognize you know, that they, you know, nobody's jealous in the Trinity. The Father's not jealous that I'm spending time with the Son and the Holy Spirit's not jealous. You know, they, they work together. They're all in one. I'm not going to go down that road anymore. But anyway, I'm, I'm thank you uh, for listening and for being here. And, and uh, I just want to pray for you uh, as we go that, that you would keep that candle burning Amen. and that you would uh, recognize that it's the spirit of truth that Jesus wants you to stay connected with. So you're in tune with headquarters. Father, thank you for these people. They're serious believers. They love to worship. They love the word. Father, they, they love to be together, love to encourage each other. And so I just ask for a, just an upgrade in their relationship with the Trinity, that nobody gets left out because they've had a denominational focus on one or the other or the, some combination. We, we, want, we want you, Jesus, to... Be alive in us, and the Holy Spirit will remember, will remind us what you've taught us. Amen. And Jesus wants to get us back to the Father. And so we, we want to open up. And I just asked for uh, uh, some uh, encounters this week. That everybody gets some kind of a, a Holy Spirit encounter, some kind of a, a, a new awareness of Jesus, some kind of a, a father, uh, father-daughter, father-son connection this week. And uh, we agree for that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, brothers, for sharing. Um, I thought maybe we have five minutes or so. Um, why, don't we, um, why don't we just take a few minutes here, um, quiet our hearts, and... And we just really soak in the